Welcome everyone, my name is Delroy Thorny and I am the Outreach Officer at the Discover Bay Marine Lab. Now today we'll be giving a presentation on living organisms and the environment. This is a part of section 1 of the c syllabus. Now first thing we have to talk about is ecology. What is ecology? Put simply, it is the study of living organisms with each other and their environment. If there is no interaction with the environment, then it can be considered ecology, especially if we do not include the study of these organisms interacting with the environment. So if you don't put the word study of, then it is not ecology, because if you break it down, ology is a study of something and eco has the environment and organisms in it. Now, the environment is basically the combination of factors that act upon an organism. So we're talking about things which are mostly abiotic. We have water, sunlight, temperature, soil. These things which act upon an organism, these are things which make up the environment. In some instances, it can be biotic factors as well. For instance, if you have a rainforest, it can't be a rainforest without trees. So the environment itself requires interaction between both living and non-living elements in the environment. Therefore, these organisms can then adapt to survive in certain parts of the environment called the habitat, which is where an organism lives. And habitats aren't just empty spaces. Organisms live there. Now, what exactly lives there? We have species. These are a group of organisms with common ancestry. These are determined by DNA sequencing. So basically the deoxyribonucleic acid. Scientists study and test these animals to see that they have something similar about them that allows them to be classified as the same species. Now, to be considered a species, the organism must be able to interbreed with each other to produce fertile offspring. For example, the loggerhead turtle cannot breed with a hawksbill turtle. As you can see, Mr. Hawksbill here is looking at you, hoping that you're taking in all this information and learning. Now, when species of the same kind come together, we develop what's called a population. So wherever there's a collection of interbreeding organisms, we have a population. Now, populations vary. You have humans, egrets, dogs, mongoose, cats. And as you can see in the image, we have a bunch of butterfly fish. I'm sure some of you enjoy eating these. And once these organisms come together, they form what's called a community. And a community is just different populations where different species come together in a specific habitat and they interact with each other. So if we look at this image right here, you see different communities, different populations of different organisms. We have phytoplankton right here at the base that feeds the zooplankton, which are fed upon by tiny shrimp and small fish, which are then fed upon by larger sea creatures such as large fish, squids, whales, and dolphins, etc. Now, this is all just a part of the buildup of every single organism interacting with each other and no animal or plant is independent if we look at this diagram right here you notice that the sun provides the energy for the producers the autotrophs and this energy is then transferred up the pyramid of biomass so the producers which are most abundant produce food for the primary consumers and then they produce for the secondary consumers and then the tertiary consumers at the top along with quaternary consumers. Now, what is an ecosystem? To put it simply, it's just a bunch of different communities in a given era interacting with their physical environment or the non-living environment, basically. To be considered an ecosystem, there has to be interaction. So remember I mentioned that ecology is the interaction of organisms with their environment but it's the study of those interactions while an ecosystem is a group of communities 
which interact with the environment. It's not the study of them, it's just the presence of the organisms interacting with each other. As you can see in this diagram right here, the shark feeds on tuna, the tuna feeds on the mackerel, the mackerel feeds on small fish, and so on and so forth. And they're interacting with the environment. They're surviving in the water, which is an abiotic factor, and sunlight produces the energy needed for the phytoplankton that produce their food. Now niche. A niche, to put it simply, is just an organism's role or position in the environment. A perfect example of this would be an earthworm. An earthworm basically burrows through the soil, helping to aerate it, and allows nutrients to pass through the soil easily, and they also fertilize the ground. So they live in that particular part of the soil, and they also help to make it more fertile for other organisms so that is their niche they inhabit that area and they don't really leave it at all so there are things that we can say that are in an ecosystem we have abiotic components and biotic components put it simply abiotic components is any non-living aspect of the environment so we're talking about sunlight temperature precipitation water moisture soil or water chemistry these are all very important in the ecosystem. They affect the organisms which are surviving in that area. And then we have the biotic components. Producers are autotrophs, we're talking about our plants, our algae. These things which produce energy from sunlight, are, they are the base for the food chain. Then we have herbivores, primary consumers, carnivores, secondary consumers, omnivores which can be considered secondary and tertiary as well, especially carnivores too, because most carnivores are both secondary and tertiary consumers. For example, you have fish eating, that eat phytoplankton. When they eat this phytoplankton, then other fish feed upon them and they are the secondary consumers. And then you have larger fish like shark which may feed upon them and they can be tertiary consumers as well. They're not necessarily omnivores, but they do still play a part. And then we have detritivores which break down decaying stuff. And these all vary over space and time. As you know, sunlight is not available throughout the day, so over time it changes. So let's talk a little bit about sampling now we're doing a quick crash course for you guys so you can just review whenever you're ready for your exams so let's talk about sampling now to put it simply a sample is just a portion or a piece or a segment of a representative of a whole now the key expression with a sample is that it must be a representative of a whole if it is not a representative of a whole it is not a sample so for instance, we have a square, right? If I'm to ask you what section of this square would be a representation of the entire whole? Some may argue that it's a half, some may say it's a third. But the answer that we're looking for is a quarter. Now, this quarter represents everything that should be in this entire square. For example, if it is say 100 square kilometers wide and conditions are uniform straight throughout then we know for a fact that if the conditions are uniform whatever is in this section should also be approximately the same in this section therefore it's a good representation of it and why is it important well it prevents us from being confused when trying to figure things out so when we're trying to count things we can't possibly count every single living thing on earth especially small organisms so for, say for example we're counting ants in this box then 100 ants in this would mean that there are 100 ants over here as well and that means that there'll be 100 ants right here just for argument's sake so in cases where we can't count everything because not all the time we can count everything then we can use sampling to give us a good estimate. So there are some specific sampling methods that are used. So for the sampling methods that we'll be looking at today, 
we'll be looking at transects and quadrats, which are mainly used for plants and animals. There are other things as well, such as aerial observations, which are used to identify and take surveys of large trees and animals. We won't be really looking at that. And we'll be also looking at collecting organisms. So different techniques to collect things which we don't want to disturb too much. So nets, pooters, tall grains, and making slight reference to capture, recapture techniques as well. So for quadrats, we're talking about mechanisms developed so that we can study distribution and abundance in uniform ecosystems. So wherever there's uniformity, you can tend to use a quadrat to get a good reading of the abundance and distribution of organisms in that area. Now, the quadrat is a square frame and it is placed randomly usually to collect organism numbers within each square. As you can see in the image right here, we have some students doing some counting of organisms there. And the quadrat can also be used to get percentage cover by subjectively determining the area which the organism occupy. So for instance, if you look right here in the image, you can see some plant cover. You can calculate the percentage of the plant cover by counting the squares and dividing it and then multiplying by 100. Now, when you're sampling along a transect, you have to have either a tape or a string. This tape is a measuring tape which has gradated numbers on it to tell you the distance that you're observing and checking along. Or the string has markings so you know how much each string length occupies. So transects are set up along an environmental gradient. So wherever there's change in the abundance or the presence of certain organisms, you can set up a transect to see what exactly is happening in that area. And we'll be looking at two different types of transects today. First one is the line transect. Now a line transect is one in which all individual organisms touching the line, the tape or the string, are recorded at intervals. Now, it must be a straight line for it to be a line transect. So it's run from one point to the next for a certain amount of distance and then everything that's touching the line is recorded. So line transects can be aquatic. You look at the image, you notice, you see the diver right here and the line transect is touching the corals and the algae in the area so they record the organisms which are touching the line or it can be terrestrial run it through a forest and you record everything that is touching that single line and for bell transects it's simply a line transect but it is parallel you have parallel lines running across from each other so we can record everything in an enclosed space. So if you pay attention right here, you notice the gradated line representing another line tape. So everything that's within this area is recorded. And a quadrat can also be used to give a belt transit reading. So what we'll do is place a quadrat along one or both sides of the tape and alternate it or keep it on one side continuously to get the abundance of organism within each area. And for animals, they are counted individually, but for plants, a percentage cover is estimated. So line transects are useful to investigate gradient or transition of species, such as zonation on a rocky shore or changes in the species abundance and diversity. So if you want to know the change in, especially plants, because most animals won't be touching the line unless they're extremely slow moving. So it's much better for getting a reading of plants in the area and you can just make height estimations are actually measure the height of certain organisms 
species of plants and then you can get what we call a vegetation profile to represent the data. The difference now with a belt transect is that it's used more for specific information. So you get more data with a belt transect. With the use of the quadrat or a parallel line, you can get more data. So you can get an abundance of species compared to the single organisms which are touching the line. And to represent this data, most times a bar chart is used. Collecting organisms. There are a variety of different ways in which we can collect organisms which we do not want to disturb. So, for some organisms to be identified, they have to be collected. And when we're doing this, only a few of them as possible should be collected and must be returned to their habitat so we do not disrupt them and cause any di disturbance in the environment. So when we do this using these other methods such as the pooters, nets, pitfalls and tulgrid then we're leaving the area undisturbed as much as possible because we don't want to disturb the organisms there. So sweep nets, these can be used in uh, grassy areas, ponds. So you can catch flying insects, you can catch aquatic bugs along the edge of ponds or lakes. We have pitfall traps which are used to smudge, catch small crawling insects and they can be set up overnight so whatever falls in from the little trap you set, they fall in and you can collect them in the morning. We have pooters which is a suction mechanism. So we have a straw or a tube in top of a bottle. You see the insect, you want specifically that one insect. The person on the end of the suction tube then inhales and it pulls the organism in safely. And another mechanism is the tulgrin. Now this is a method used to get organisms out of the soil. Most organisms which are had in the soil tend to be there because it is cooler for them. So if you dig into the ground a little bit, it is a little bit cooler than the surface which is normally hot. So what you can do is set up a light source with a reflector behind it. So all that light sends all those light rays into the soil, heating it up, and organisms which are inside would then flee downward through the funnel, through the wash wire mesh and then into the beaker. Now these are just some mechanisms which can be used. There are other things such as plantar nets and there are other many but this is where we stop for today. I hope you guys learned something new. If you have any questions please don't be afraid to comment and we will answer you as soon as we can. Have a great day guys and these are the references for your perusal. See you all next time.